this one verse that I want to share tonight. It is good to be back. It's good to see all of you again tonight. And we love every one of you. And we're grateful for your support of us and for your love that you have for us, that you convey on us. Uh, we always feel very welcome when we're here. <coughs> always feel very accepted. Amen. 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 And i got to tell you, I don't know all the reasons why. I suspect I know a few of them, but you guys are very easy to preach to. <laughs> you ever thought about that? <laughs> yeah. It takes a certain atmosphere to be able to preach effectively, to yes. be able to preach and yes. teach effectively. And I always feel a very strong anointing when I'm here in this house. And so I, I think it's because the atmosphere is set and there's liberty and there's freedom here. And I think that you guys always come expecting something from God, you know, and that helps right there. So there's a culmination of things, a lot of things. I think I'm praying and studying more than I ever have in my life. So that's that's got to be a plus, right? <laughs> that's got to be a plus. But um, I think you guys really pull it out of me. And Jamaica used to do that. Boy, every time I went down there, I say used to. I'm sure they still would. I just haven't been in two and a half years now. But I will go back, yeah. I'm going to go back later this year. Um, just touching on the seed real quick. Uh, doc, I'm, I'm friends with uh, Dr. Mark Sharona on Facebook, and he posted a little thing this morning early that I liked, and I reshared it on my wall about uh, the acorn and becoming a mighty oak tree. And I thought back to when I said a couple of services ago that even the mighty oak tree was once a nut that just held its ground. <laughs> and... Uh, but he, he was a little deeper and more profound than me. <laughs> but, but he talked about it. He touched briefly on how all of the potential, and uh, he said the destiny and the DNA are all inside of that acorn. Right. Now, I liked the way he put that. And, you know, just talking about seed, all of the seeds that we have, no matter how small or insignificant they look like, uh, they have the DNA in them, Right. They have all of the DNA, all of the makeup that's necessary for that to become something great. Amen. Yeah. And when I saw that this morning, I thought, that's good. i got to reshare that. So I, I saved it over onto my wall, too. But I liked it. Are you there, Hebrews 13 and 15? Okay, one verse. By him, him being Jesus Christ here, the previous few verses are talking about him uh, taking care of the sin debt with his blood. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise unto God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Amen. Amen. By him, therefore, by Jesus, let us offer the sacrifice of praise. So it comes right out of verses talking about how there doesn't need to be a sacrificial lamb or a scapegoat anymore. If you read those verses ahead of that one. Uh, because he suffered outside of the gates of the city for once and for all, for all of mankind. And he shed his blood. And so then the, then the writer goes on to say, By him, therefore, therefore is always there for a reason. It's, it always ties two thoughts together. By him, therefore, by his, therefore, because of his sacrifice, because of the price he paid, let us offer the sacrifice of praise unto God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. The one thing that I want to say right out of the gate that isn't even in my notes but just came to me when I was reading that verse is that it is His sacrifice that has to be the foundation for our praise and worship. His sacrifice must be, because if it's anything else, then you'll get a warped view about your praise, and you'll start thinking everything's got to go good in life before I can praise God. And everything has to happen just right. And then you you can look through Facebook in the mornings, and, and I, now I hope I'm not stepping on any toes here, but uh, uh, one of my guy friends put something on there a couple days ago about uh, love and life right now. And he went on down this list of how everything was going good and stuff. But I was thinking back to five days before that, how he had put on there uh, how he hated his life. And he used a little phrase that I'm not going to repeat. Yeah. But he was talking about how everything was going wrong and everything was going bad. Now, here's the deal, okay? We're believers. Now, we've got to understand the foundation of our praise and worship, okay? we got to understand why we praise. We don't praise because everything is going right that day. We don't praise because every little aspect and detail of our life is falling into place like we want it to. That will happen down the road. 
I promise you, and God even promises you, that when you walk with Him and give your life to Him and begin to dive into the Word and abide in Him and let His words abide in you, that it will begin to impact your life, okay? That's another lesson for another time. It will turn around the events and the affairs of your life, and it will line your life up, okay? And your life will begin to make sense. But we cannot sit back and wait on all of that to happen to begin to praise Him, though. That's right. And so the writer tells us right here the foundation for our praise, and he even tells us it is a sacrifice sometimes, right? It is a sacrifice sometimes to praise Him continually, and that should be the fruit of our lips, and we should give thanks to His name. Everything, uh, and, and so I was flashing back today as I was studying for this, I flashed back to Genesis, the first, second, and third chapter. And I thought just for a moment about how interesting it was that in creation God created the environment that was necessary for the thing to survive in before he created the thing. I mean, it just sounds like common sense, but he, he, cre he separated, uh, well, he, he said, let there be light, and there was light. He separated the waters from dry land. He moved everything, positioned it all. He, separate, he took the clouds up here, separated the two firmaments. He began to create grass. He put seed in everything that he created. He created grass and dry ground. He did all this work uh, to create the proper environment, right? To create the right environment for the things, the beasts, and, and, and for mankind, for the living things that he was about to create and set in that environment. He had everything set in place first so that we could thrive in our environment, right. so that there would be no risk to us, but we could, we could exist there so he created dry land and he created the grass of the earth and the fields and, and all of the herbs and the trees and leaves. Everything was created. Then he began to create the beast of the field and he began to create all the animals and he began to put the fish in the water. And he created all of them before he even created man. Why? Because man needed something to eat. <laughs> I'm just playing with you. Right? Uh, but he, uh, he created the environment first, then he created man. All right? He created all the animals. But everything was originally created to operate within a specific environment, okay? And they, even God modeled that for us in Genesis. If you remove something from its environment or take someone out of its environment, it will cease to be effective. As a matter of fact, sometimes in some situations, when you take something out of its environment that it was created to be in, it will die. That's right. Right? In other words, if you take a fish out of water... No matter how pretty that fish is in water, that fish cannot live outside of water because it was created to live in water, right? right. And so you've seen that happen before. Uh, if you remove something or someone from its environment, it will cease to be effective. It will no longer have the impact that it was created to have, okay? I'm going somewhere with this. And what's more, what's even worse than death is spiritual death. It's separation from God. That's really what we should be afraid of. Because as believers, we know death is transportation to the presence of God. All right, but, but spiritual death is the absence of God's presence in a man or woman's life, okay? That is, that's at the root of every ill that plagues us as an individual or as societies around the world. It's the lack of God's presence. It's the lack of relationship with the Creator. Man cannot and will not live up to the potential and purpose that God built into him until, until the love and intimacy that man and God enjoyed in the garden is restored into their life. Right. That, is the, that is the environment. Man, because life in the presence of God is man's environment. Yeah. Yeah. Life in God's presence is, the, is man's environment. It's our, it's our ultimate environment. It's, okay, it's our optimal environment. God's presence is our greatest need. Man cannot truly live. We can exist right. and we can go through the motions, but we cannot truly live until the relationship between God and man is restored. Now, I know that Jesus went to Calvary to restore that, and I'm not talking about specifically just salvation here, although that is essential. He did what he had to do to restore it, but then people have to believe on that. Right. They have to accept the finished work of the cross, and they have to walk in it, embrace it, and begin to live it out in their life. And even beyond salvation, even many believers get saved. They go through all these first love uh, emotions of wanting to be in, in the presence of God, wanting to be in the Word of God, wanting to be in the house of God, wanting to be around the people of God, 
And then when the new begins to wear off a little bit, just like it did in your relationship, then all of a sudden it becomes a little less important and you begin to draw back and you begin to pull back. You begin to not do all the little things that you once did. And, and, and all of a sudden you begin to find yourself. Now it's not an overnight thing. It's not a, just a, a decision that you make immediately. But over a, over a period of time, there begins to develop this separation, this coldness between you and God. And it's not that God has went anywhere. It's that you're just no longer fellowshipping with Him. You're no longer fellowshipping with Him, okay? In other words, uh, the frustration that a lot of believers have in their life is there because they're not in touch with their Creator. They're not in touch with Him on a daily basis. Because that's what God desires. He desires to walk... John chapter 15 is about relationship. Right. It's all about relationship. Those were his parting words to his disciples in that chapter. In chapter 15, they had just passed through the vineyards and through the, the brook Kidron and were on their way to the olive garden uh, the, where he was going to, you know, the garden of Gethsemane where he was going to pray and he was going to be arrested. And his last words with his disciples, he begins to hold up a cluster of grapes and teach them about relationship. And he says, I am the vine, yes. you're the branches. Yes. You have to abide in me yes. so that you can bear fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. But he goes into that and he begins to just teach them. And he breaks it down even further and says that when you separate from me and you're not abiding in me, then you begin to wither. That's what he said, right? right. You begin to wither and dry up because you're cut off from your life source. And branches that wither and dry up are gathered together and burned in, in bonfires is what the Message Bible says. That's all they're good for is kindling, good kindling, okay? And so... Uh, I, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that part, but I want you to understand just the foundation here is that we are we are to be in God's presence to thrive and to reach full potential, potential to reach maximum potential, to walk in victory, to see success in our lives and to find purpose, tap into that and reach that. We are to be in God's presence. We're to be in God's Word and God's Word in us. He, and he even described that there in John 15 about abiding in my word and my word abiding in you. And you'll ask what you want, right? Now, I don't know about you, but have you been getting everything you want lately? No. Is the shortcoming with God? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, right? So I think that it's the, a little more abiding needs to take yeah. place and a little more connecting needs to take place. And we need to push ourselves deeper into His presence and the things that we deem to be important need to become a little less important so that the things that really are important can become more important, right? right, right. In, in other words, keeping the main thing the main thing, right? right. Amen. So, uh, an attitude of gratitude and thankfulness, they're both key to accessing God's presence. Both very key to accessing God's manifested presence. Let me just quickly establish that God is here right now, and He's with us every day, and He said, I'm with you always. He Amen. said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. But, and so we know that we have that promise, and we're grateful for that, because the world without that would be a terrible place. But what we really are after in our life every day is the manifested presence of God. We're after God to reveal Himself and show up and begin to move. We want to see Him moving in our life. We want to see Him manifest, even if it's so that we can feel that tangible presence of God. You know what I'm talking about? Where you're just in your scriptures that day, and all of a sudden you begin to feel Him, and you realize that He's with you. It's not that He just walked into the room, but He manifested. He revealed Himself to you. You feel that, and sometimes feeling that pushes through you, you through every problem that you're going through. It pulls you up out of depression, out of anxiety, out of stress. It can pull you up out of a sick bed. Just feeling the presence of God is that important, that significant, that manifested presence, okay? It doesn't exist just in church services, but it's meant for us to tap into on a daily basis, all right? Then praise and worship will really be the fruit of your lips. When you have an attitude of gratitude and thankfulness and you're accessing the presence of God, then praise and worship will be the fruit of your lips. I'm convinced that in the church world there are services that take place all the time where you'll find a lot of people making noise unto God. Uh, and the Bible does say to praise Him with our voices and all the instruments that we want to, right? Uh, uh, but I'm not convinced that a lot of noise always equates to a lot of praise. Yeah. It, it doesn't always, okay? Uh, when we re read in Hebrews, the fruit of our lips... Fruit doesn't just pop up. Fruit has to come from a source, right? Yeah. 
has to come from a source. Lip service without a source really means nothing at all. Um, if you said hallelujah just because I did or someone standing next to you did, that's not so much praise. That's more of an echo. That's you echoing something that you heard someone else say or something that you heard the worship leaders say. Uh, uh, and it's their job to, to inspire us and to provoke us and challenge us to begin to worship. But, but until it comes from our heart, it's just lip service. It doesn't have the significance that it needs to have if we're not grateful in our heart and thankful in our heart. Uh, and, and we're not standing on that proper foundation, the foundation, remember, of the shed blood of Jesus, the sacrifice that he made. Yeah. All right, remember, that's our foundation. That's what we refer back to anytime we need a picker-upper, right? Anytime we need uh, something to feel good about in our life, we look back at the sacrifice that he paid for us. Yeah. That is what lets me pull myself up by my bootstraps and go on, right? Mm -hmm. Is when I think of what he did for me, amen? Right. amen. And he'll keep doing for me. Okay, he will keep doing for me, but what he already did for me is enough. If he does nothing else for me, what he already did on Calvary is enough. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Fruit doesn't just pop out, okay? Uh, you can holler down into a cave and say, I love you, and it'll holler back, I love you, but the cave's not thinking about you, okay? I mean, it's just an echo is all it is. And we're, we're echoing. We're just echoing what people are telling us to echo or what other people around us are saying. So a lot of times in church services we have that, but it's not really the fruit of their lips. It's not born out of the confines of their heart. It's not a result of a deep relationship with God. Okay, this is not this is not a, a message to get on to us. This is a message to pull us in deeper. Amen? Amen. Tell your neighbor deeper. Hallelujah. Deeper, deeper, deeper. Most of the time, uh, people will work real hard at trying to look spiritual, but I don't want to look spiritual. I want to be spiritual. I want to push into the things of God. I don't care what I look like, and I, I don't want to just try and sound spiritual for the sake of putting a facade on or trying to impress somebody. Amen. I don't want to just look it I, I, or sound it. I want to be it. I want to be spiritual. I want a, a spiritual connection to a life source that sustains this world. Amen? Amen. The life source that holds this world together is the very Word of God and Spirit of God. That is what is holding this world together. The entire cosmos as we know it is the Word of God and the power of God. And we need that connection to that source on a daily basis. Amen? Amen. We need that, all right? So praise is action because you've got to praise God with the fruit of your lips and so forth, okay? But praise is also attitude. So let me just break it down and dive into this. If you have action without attitude, it's the same thing as that echo in the cave, okay? But your, your lips are saying something that may not really be in your heart, but it's the fruit of your lips that, that is the more important thing. So action deals with your lips or with your, your things that you're doing, but attitude deals with your heart, all right? It deals with what's in your heart. Uh, people can say thank you Jesus all day long and say oh hallelujah but not really be thankful at all. Right. Just saying the things they know they need to say and uh, saying what other people are saying but not really be thankful at all. Have you ever caught your kids before uh, uh, opening Christmas gifts or opening birthday gifts? <laughs> And they say thank you, but you can see disappointment all over their face. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, now, the thing is, is that they've been taught to do that. And so we commend them on one hand for not, for not being rude or offensive. But you know, I mean, I, I saw my son one time. Uh, I, I, we saved up, Stacey and I, I'll never forget this, saved up to buy a set of drums for him. And uh, it was we spent more money on him than we did on anyone else that year and even on each other to buy him a set of drums. And uh, he tore them open, and he looked at them, and he th shoved them to the side and said, what's next? And, I mean, we had been saving and working and doing everything, and I wanted to just grab him and take him back there and belt him is what I wanted to do. Now, and I didn't do that, but, I mean, it stung to look and see my child acting that ungrateful over something that I paid a dear price to put in his hands. Now, okay... But now I got your attention, don't I? <laughs> okay, so we'll tell God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But he knows when we're really grateful and when we're really not. He knows when it's just lip service, right? And he knows because he is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So he knows if it's coming from our heart or not. You say, well, Pastor Mark, what if I'm not thankful for it? Well, then we need to address how to deal with the attitude. We need to address how to be thankful for the right things, first of all. Amen. Because then that will begin to affect our attitude and make us a grateful person and a thankful person all the time. 
Amen? Amen. Because gratitude and thankfulness aren't determined by your situation or your circumstances or what's in your pocket that day or what's not in your pocket that day. Amen. Those things are not to be determined by that. And until you can get beyond that and get past that, you'll never have the things that really matter in life. Right. You'll never have the true riches of life, the spiritual things that God desires to give us. We'll never have that. I mean, the jingle in your pocket, some cash in your wallet, a car, a house, all those things are wonderful, but those things are trivial to God. Right. They're trivial compared to the things that He really wants to give us and impart to us, but we have He has to know that we're grateful and that we're thankful and that we're on the right foundation before He can release those things into our life. Amen? Amen. Okay. <clears throat> let, me, uh, let, me, let me skip forward here, okay? I put this on my Facebook page a few weeks ago. Your lips should be speaking what your heart is leaking. Amen? <laughs> your lips should be speaking what your heart is leaking. And Jesus said it this way, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's what he said, right? When the heart is full of thankfulness, it'll be reflected by what comes from your lips. If you're quiet and you just sit around and listen to people long enough, you can tell by what comes out of their mouth if they're thankful or not. You can just spend a little bit of time around people, and if there's bitterness in their heart, it's going to leak up out of their mouth. If there's hatefulness in their heart, it's going to make its way up out of their mouth, right? If there's unforgiveness, even if there's lust, whatever might be deep down into their heart and rooted in their heart, whatever has a hold of it, if you listen long enough, it comes up out of their lips, right? right? Yeah. They cannot hide what's in their heart, right. all right? I know this is not easy to swallow, <laughs> But I'm, I'm going to give you some keys to breakthrough in just a moment, okay? If there's thanksgiving down in your heart, then praise is going to come out of your mouth. Amen. Amen. No matter what you're going through in life, no matter where you're at, what you're facing, what you're dealing with, if there is thanksgiving down in your heart, then praise will manifest out of your mouth. Praise will come up out of your lips, right? Amen. Amen. There's a lot of things that can be said about King David. Some of them are good, but you know what? Some of the stuff that we could say about him is not really admirable at all. We could say some things about him, and, and we could criticize him a little bit uh, for the things that happened in his life. He had an affair. He disobeyed God. Uh, there were just different things, you know, that he had done that wasn't really all that commendable. But God, when God talked about David, they, he said, I found a man after my own heart. That's what God said about David. Not that David was a perfect pattern of who God is, not at all, okay? But he's a man after God's heart, a man that's pursuant of God's heart, chasing God's heart, chasing after the heart of God. Uh, he was a man that loved God and knew how to chase God and love Him and flirt with Him, if you will, and pitch woo, as the old-timers would put it, all right? David was a man who was in love with God. It was obvious, all right? He played instruments for him. He created instruments for him uh, just to praise him. He wrote songs for him. He did poetry. He wrote poetry for God, all right? He chased after a relationship with Almighty God. He was a man after God's heart. Now, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Now, do you understand why Scripture says he was a man after God's heart? Because he was an adulterer, and he was a murderer, and he had blood on his hands, and he had disobedience in his heart at one point in time in his life. But he was a man after God's heart because he was a man that in spite of all of his shortcomings, he chased after relationship with Almighty God. Amen. Now I'll even take that a little bit deeper here in just a minute, okay? But, but God liked it that David chased after him. He loved it, in fact. And in return, he, he decided, I'm going to make this boy king. And he lifted David up and promoted him and anointed him to be king. Uh, now I want you to get this because it's very significant. David's only qualification for a king was that he was obsessed with praising and loving God. He didn't have kings in his blood. He wasn't next in line for the throne. He wasn't trained. He hadn't been to the royal schools. There was no reason whatsoever that he should have been chosen to be king and set on the throne over an entire nation. But God was impressed with his attitude. Amen. That tells us something about the necessity of having a good attitude and being thankful and, and maintaining gratitude in life. And there was something about David that impressed God so much, he said, I'm going to make you king. And he began to bless him and anoint him, right? Amen. His daddy was just a farmer. That's all he was. Jesse was a farmer. He had sheep, a lot of sheep. Now, I know David and lion killed the bear protecting the sheep, but that didn't qualify him to be king. 
Every shepherd probably had to do that at some point in time to protect the flock, okay? The one thing that he had going for him was an attitude of gratitude. And because of his thanksgiving, he got promotion. Can you say amen? Amen. Because it's hard to kill a thankful person, right? Amen. Amen. God likes thankful people. He blesses thankful yes. people. Yes. He doesn't care who likes it either. When he gets ready to bless them, he blesses them in front of everybody. Right. He doesn't Amen. care whether you approve or not, whether they meet your criteria or not. He lifts them up, promotes them, and blesses them right on the spot. Amen. Amen. Yeah, and talking about David, the Bible also said the man looks at the outer things or the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Right. God looks at the heart. Some of the people that God has blessed the most in life are people who just have an attitude of gratitude. Amen. Just somebody who just, it, their heart is saturated with thankfulness and thanksgiving, right? The attitude just leaks out of them everywhere they go. You ever sit and have a conversation with somebody and they start talking about God and they start talking about something God done for them and, and just tears just start coming down. I mean, it's leaking out right there. Right. They're so thankful for God, and they love Him so much, they can't even talk about it without tears starting to stream down their face. Amen? See, it's hard to beat that. You can't hold a person like that down. Mm -hmm. Somebody that's that grateful and that thankful, and that, that's willing to praise God in spite of everything, you, you can't hold them down. Amen? Amen? Even Job was stripped down to nothing in his life. Now, I know Job said some silly stuff in the middle of his battles, right. but, but he also said this. His wife said to him, I mean, he, you know, we don't really take into consideration that his wife went through that stuff too. His wife was right there with him, and she said, Job, curse God and die. You know, I mean, just get it over with. And he said, even in the midst of all of it, he said, you know what? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He had a blessing down in him. After losing everything, he had a blessing down in him for the name of God. Amen. And when Job started praising God, and he started praying for his friends in sackcloth and ashes, God said, I'm going to break this curse right now. I'm going to turn things around for you, and I'm going to give you double for your trouble. Amen? Why? Because he kept his integrity. His integrity was in his praise. It wasn't, his integrity wasn't in the vehicles that he lost. I mean, it's not in the house. It's not in the business. Our integrity is not even in our health. Our integrity is in our praise. And the devil, no matter how hard he hits us, cannot take that. And that is the thing that drives him the, the most insane, is that when he hits and attacks and moves in and, and, and tries, that's what makes us a peculiar people. And he can't figure it out because he wants to touch and afflict and torment and take things away from us, but we keep praising God anyway. Yeah. He cannot take that. That is an attitude yeah. that is down in the heart that can't be taken. Amen? Amen. Right. I believe it's what the Bible refers to when it talks about the key of David. I believe praise was the key of David. And praise has the potential to unlock things. You don't need a key if something isn't locked. And, and people don't lock up what's not valuable. And the Bible talks about the key of David. David found a key to unlock hidden treasures. And I believe the key was his praise. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this as quick as I can and give you a few points about the kingdom of David. When, uh, when the enemy's attacking you in any area, you're going to find that praise is not only an action and an attitude, but it can become a weapon in your hands. Uh -huh. And you can praise your way through a situation. Amen. You can praise your way out of adversity. Right. Praise your way through the storm. Amen? Amen? You might not feel like it, but that's yeah. why it's called a sacrifice. That's, right. that's why it's called that's a sacrifice, right? right? right. You've Amen. got to do it anyway. It'll trigger a defense mechanism that will surround you, and you'll begin to rejoice and thank God. Whenever anger tries to take over you or discouragement or depression, then something down inside of you, you'll begin to thank God and praise Him and get into His Word. His Word will rise up out of you and the devil will begin to lose his grip in whatever area it is. It'll just slide off of you. This is the key of David right here. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Amen. That's the key of David, okay? His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Amen. It's natural to grieve in our life. There are different things in life and there are different periods that we go through where grief is a natural part of our life. And it's just part of being human, unfortunately, and we all have to deal with it. Uh, but, but some people, in the midst of their grief, they begin to turn to things. Some people begin to turn to other people. Some people begin to turn to a bottle. Some of them turn to pills. People just start turning to everything. Well, I'm telling you, you've got to turn to what you know will work. And what works is praise. Praise will unlock the chains of grief off of your life and it will set you free. 
Grieving's a natural thing, but not when it seizes control of your life and your thoughts and your sleep, and it starts dragging you down and holding you down in a miry pit, and it stops all your momentum and all your movement forward, then it's not natural anymore after that. If it begins to sweep you away and, and hold on to you and not turn loose of you, then you've got to let the sacrifice of praise start unlocking the, the power of God in your life. Hallelujah. I want to tell you what David discovered about God. It's, it's kind of... It's kind of hard to explain, and I'm going to do it quickly, uh, because you're living in it right now. We're all living in it, whether we realize it or not. We're living in David's wisdom. We're living inside the revelation that he had way back in the Old Testament. Yeah. David discovered something about God that put him all the way in another dimension way before his time. At the time that, that David lived, there were set rules on how one could approach God. Incense and blood sacrifices were required. The priest had to wear a certain garment, and it couldn't have any. He couldn't have any sin in his life. He was responsible for the fire and the incense, and the fire on the altar. And if the two fires were different at all, then God would kill him. And you have to understand the time that David lived in. That's how particular God was about how you approached him. You didn't just run up on God. You could, I mean, do you remember the story about Uzzah, how they were bringing back the Ark of the Covenant and, and, he, and the oxen stumbled and he reached out to steady the Ark of the Covenant and he died yeah. right there. God killed him right there because Uzzah didn't have the right to touch God. He didn't have the right to do that. What that was saying was that God needed his help and God didn't need anyone's help. Yeah. And he didn't need that, okay? He didn't need to be run up on. Now listen, I want to help you understand something though. It's not that God was moody. So get that, you need to understand that. It's that He is holy. Yeah. Amen. And we don't fully Amen. comprehend holiness like God is holy. Yeah. It wasn't that He was moody or just had to be in the right mood before you could touch Him. No, He's holy. Yeah. Everything that He had set in place, He had set in place for their own protection. Yeah. Not so that He could appear moody or angry with them, but to protect them from being consumed by His presence. Because he knew he was a holy God, and any type of sin that approached him and got too close to him, got into his presence, would be consumed, because our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Okay, Amen. so it's not that he was moody or angry all the time, or just looking for, uh, for someone to mess up, but he's holy. Right. Now that right, that right there ought to just really yeah. start setting Hallelujah. you free right there. Hallelujah. Just to under, just to understand that it wasn't he wasn't looking for a reason to squash you, but, yeah. but is that he had to protect you. He had to protect you from his holiness, okay? He told Moses not to look at his face. Moses said, Lord, I want to see you. I want to see your glory. And the Lord agreed to it, but he said, here's what I'm going to do. He took Moses and he placed him in the cleft of the rock. And he walked by Moses and then he moved his hand off and let Moses see the back parts of God. And, and, and Moses saw the backside of God as he walked off. And that was so powerful that Moses' face began to glow for days afterward. And it scared the children of Israel when he came down off the mountain. They had to make a veil to put over his face because he was glowing in the dark from seeing the back part of God. Amen. That's how holy God is. That's how powerful the presence of God is. God's an awesome God, an incredible yeah. God. The Bible says He's a terrible God. But the word terrible, if you really look closely at it, means intense and extreme. Right. It doesn't mean something to be feared in a sense of He's just looking for a chance to hurt you. That's not what it means. It just means that He's so intense and so extreme and so powerful. God would swallow up nations. When He got ready to swallow up the nations that were fighting against His children, He would just swallow them up. He got ready to fight. He would use locusts or firestorms. Uh, he would use hailstorms, whatever. He, had, he got so mad at one army, He struck every one of them there with hemorrhoids. And you don't believe me? Look it up. It's in the Old Testament. It's there. And the entire army fell out. You didn't fool with God. He struck people with leprosy. Uh, you couldn't even approach a king in that day without permission, let alone God, okay? But listen, I said all that because I wanted to set this up. David learned something about God. He figured something out about God. In a dispensation that required the blood of bullocks and goats and incense and fires and ceremonial washings and cleansings, David found a spot in God that would let him come up into the presence of God without being killed. Hallelujah. Amen. He didn't have all the requirements met, and he approached him with dirty hands. Sometimes he had blood on his hands from battle even, but David made it all the way into the most holy place with God, and he didn't get killed. And he even told you how he did it. Are you ready to know how he did it? Amen. 
He said, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, yeah. right. into his courts with praise. Right. Be thankful unto him and bless his name, for the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. So David said, if you'll praise him and if you're a thankful person, he'll let you come all the way up yeah. into his presence. Yeah. Amen. 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 If you'll praise him and you're thankful. So praise is more than action. It's more than attitude. It's more than protection. It's access. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. is access. Amen. When you praise God, He can be accessed. Wow, that's good. Now I understand that we have access to the blood of Jesus Christ, but even in today's dispensation, I'm talking about David, who was existing in a dispensation before the blood of Christ. Okay, but he still was granted access based upon the praise and the thankfulness that he had in his heart. He loved God. He was grateful. He was genuinely humble for the blessing of the Lord on his life. And he was grateful and thankful. And he came into the presence of God before the, the cross, before the sacrifice of the cross. When you begin to praise God, it takes you out of the natural and into the supernatural. And you can be given access to God. You can be driving your car down the road. Start offering praise up to God and he'll manifest right there in the car with you. Right there in the car with you. I heard Jesse DuPlanis say one time he was worshiping, he was on a trip. He took off on a trip that was about three hours away to go pray for somebody. And he said he got in his car, started the car, backed out and started down the road. And he said he began to praise the Lord and pray in tongues and just worship the Lord. And he said the Lord manifested in the cab of, in, in the cab of his car. And he said it was, it was like a thick smoke filled the car so thick that he couldn't see the road in front of him. And he said he he just lost. He just he said he was lost in the presence of God. Didn't know how to drive his car. Didn't know how to stop his car. Didn't know where he was. Couldn't see where he was going. And he said that all of a sudden, when he opened his eyes, he was sitting at the hospital that he had taken out for. And he looked at the clock. Didn't understand what had just happened. He got out and he went into the hospital. And when he walked in the door, everyone in there. Was their eye, they just had this puzzled look on their face, and they said, Brother Jesse, how did you get here so fast? And, and, he, and they said, you had to have been close. You said you were at your office. And he said, I was at my office. When I spoke to you on the phone a while ago, I walked out the, of the office, got in my car, and left. And they said, Jesse, we just talked to you 30 minutes ago. And it's a three-hour drive from your office to here. Amen? Wow. Are you getting that? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> the presence of God, amen, is access, there's access to the presence of God. In the presence of God is the supernatural, amen, amen. it's the power of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Psalm 22, 3 says, he inhabits the praises of his people. That's right. When you start praising God, hallelujah, you get access. Amen. You get access. It's not that he shows up all of a sudden, it's that you're granted access into a realm that existed all along. I mean, he's all around us, right? Yes, yes. And he gives you access into a realm. There's two realms. We know that a natural realm and a spirit realm. And it's, it's, it's one that few access the spiritual realm because they don't have the key to get into the door. And I'm here to tell you, contrary to what the Matrix says, it's not the internet hookup you need. Yeah. It's praise. Yeah. Amen. It's the key of David. Praise unlocks the door to the supernatural and grants you access to God. Amen. Amen. Right. Hallelujah. Agreed. Moses' tabernacle was operating on one mountain and the Ark of the Covenant had been taken. The enemies of Israel... Uh, had it for a season. David was granted the opportunity to recapture it, to go back and get the glory of God and bring it back home with him. And, and I mentioned this a while ago. In the process of transportation, they had they had decided they didn't go back and read how do we transport it, how do we carry it, what do we need to do. So they made this uh, this wagon sort of, and they got some oxen to pull it on, and, and they just they just came up with a plan. Is what they did. They came up with their best strategy for relocating the presence of God. And then they head out there and they get it and they load it up. And they're excited and they're praising God. And they, it's, you know, and they start back in and the oxen stumble and the thing begins to shift like it's going to slide off the wagon. And the one man, Uzzah, he reached his hand out and put his hand on it and he died instantly. And, and David was so upset. He was so upset over that and so scared over what had happened and really angry because he's like, I'm only trying to do what's right here. And so he had a little fit. He threw himself a little fit and he parked the ark out there at Obed-Edom's house and he left it there. And then he went on back home. But then over time, God began to bless Obed-Edom. 
And everything that he did while the ark was there began to prosper. And David saw the blessing and he got jealous. And he said, wait a minute. We've got to get that thing back here in Israel where it belongs. But this time he went back and he did the research. And he studied how it was supposed to take place. And they went in and they didn't. I'm not going to get into that for the sake of time. But they carried it right this time. And they brought the ark back. Okay? Understand something, all right? The tabernacle of Moses existed that entire time on the mountain with the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. The brazen altar was there, the brazen labor, the candlesticks, the table of showbread, the altar of incense. The priests were walking around ministering there. There was a curtain. The veil was still there, separated the inner court from the outer court. But you know what was not there? The Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> that whole time, the Ark of the Covenant wasn't even in there. But they were carrying on as if it was. Still doing all the priestly duties. Still doing everything. There was still a veil there as if something was in there. But but God had been gone. He, the presence of God had been gone for a long time. And there's still... Now, I could preach on that right there. Yeah. There are a lot of churches going through the motions yeah. and still acting like God's there. Still going through all these routines and rituals and motions. But God's not even there anymore. Right. And they don't even realize that they need to take some steps to reconnect to the power of God yeah. again. Yeah. They need to take some steps to get reconnected again. Amen? Amen. Amen. The ark represented God's presence. Now, I'm going to wrap these last few pages up quickly, okay? Uh, so give me a little bit more grace, all right? There, there are many denominations and churches that go through that, not even realizing God. Everything's business as usual, service as usual, no presence of God. Yeah. And you may not realize that because when you come here, you feel the presence of God. Yeah. But I've gotten out <laughs> a little bit. I've traveled. I've been around, I've preached in churches before where it was dry. I mean, and it just was, oh my God, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, what's going on? Am I saying something wrong? I mean, I didn't even feel anointed sometimes in there. It's just like there was no presence there. And all the whole service was just about getting said what needed to be said and getting through there and getting out of there and hoping they never invited me back. And, and I mean, I've seen it before. I've seen that before. There are, and there are hundreds and hundreds of churches like that. No presence of God, no move of God, no freedom, no liberty. Now David, he's bringing back the Ark of the Covenant. He's dancing and he's praising God. He brings it back. He's dancing in a dimension that's so strong he embarrassed his wife. And you know, she, she told him that he looked like a fool. And she said, David, you should have more dignity. You're a king. You're a king. You should act like a king. You should have more dignity because he had danced himself out of most of his clothes. That was the problem. So she got jealous and she got upset. She was the daughter of a king, so she knew how a king was supposed to act. Problem was, she was the daughter of the king that God rejected. She was Saul's daughter. And her daddy was in love with positions and titles, and he was out to impress people. David was madly in love with God. And he didn't care about positions, titles. He didn't care about impressing people. He didn't care what he looked like or what he acted like. He might have looked like a fool, but he had something that her daddy never had. He had the favor of God. Amen? He had the presence of God. Amen. So he brought the Ark of the Covenant back. He took it up to the top of Mount Zion and he put it in a one-room tent. I'm going to tell you what happened, okay? No brazen altar, no brazen labor, no altar of incense, no table of showbread, no candlesticks, no veil, nothing like that. It was a big empty room with nothing in it but the Ark of the Covenant. He brought it back with a celebration of praise. And 1 Chronicles 15 recorded the entire event. They were all praising, they were singing, they were shouting and dancing. None of them danced harder than David, we already said that. So they placed the ark in that one room and God was satisfied with abandoning all that religious routine for a praise and a dance. Amen? Amen. God was satisfied with it. All David had made to go in there in, inside of that tent with the ark was instruments. He, had men, he brought men in and he began to pay them to make new instruments. He said, come up with stuff. Just come up with instruments, make them. And he filled that tent up with instruments for praising God. He told him, come up with new ways to praise Him. We've studied the tabernacle of Moses for years, and we've looked at all the various pictures of it, everything that it represented, but we need to look closer at the tabernacle of David. Uh, through symbolism, Moses' tabernacle, it, it looks forward to the finished work of cross, but David's tabernacle shows us the matrix that the church is existing in right now. Beyond the finished work of the cross, David's tab tabernacle is a picture of where the, all the bloodshed is out of the way. It's a finished work now, 
Everything is over. The sacrifices have all been made. They're all concluded. The requirement for holiness has been met. And now there's a priesthood that has nothing else to offer up but praise. Amen? Wow. And that's New Testament. You can get in the New Testament and see where we're a royal priest and a holy nation, a peculiar people. And God's satisfied to dwell in the midst of a praising people. Amen? Not long after David had died, though, he was resting with his fathers, and the priesthood and the people of God reverted back to the tabernacle of Moses. And that's why the ark ended up back in the tabernacle of Moses again. But you remember when John the Baptist came and Jesus came? The scribes and the Pharisees were following them around. They were always quoting Moses in the law. See, heaven was so displeased with all of their rituals and routines and stuff that there had been 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Bible says in the book of Acts, in the last days, one of the signs of the end time would be the restoration of the tabernacle of David. That's what the book of Acts says. Do you know what some, including the devils, called Jesus when he came on the scene? Son of David. They called him the son of David. Whenever he came up to men who were possessed, the demons would say, What have you to do with us, son of David? It's not our time. You can't torment us yet. So they recognized him as the son of David. And people keep looking, people kept looking to Jerusalem for a building to go up. But what you should be looking for is for a system of praise that has been and is being put together right now all over the world. When you see Catholics and Presbyterians and Pentecostals and Episcopalians and Baptists and, and, and blacks and whites and Hispanics and everybody all coming together, being swept away with a move of praise and worship. There is a movement of praise and worship now. The Jesus culture, right. all the different right. ones that have that came before that. There is a movement of praise and worship Amen. throughout the earth today. And what you're seeing is the restoration of the tabernacle of David. Mm -hmm. When you see these things, the Bible says it's a sign that your redemption draws nigh. Amen? Amen. 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 Everywhere you go now, you see churches with praise teams, mm -hmm. instruments, worship right. leaders. See, I don't know if you remember, but that was not always the case. Yeah. That's right. That was not always the That's case. Right. I mean, there was a time where most churches just had an organ or a piano and songbooks everywhere. Right. But now you're starting to see praise teams, yeah. entire teams of people all over the... And it's been going on for like 20 years. It's been right. happening. But, but see, now it's starting to get into churches that... I had a friend who served in a, in a Methodist church. It was the oldest church in his community. Uh, stained glass, everything. <laughs> and I went in there and saw the tour of the place... And, uh, and even in that old Methodist church, and, and they were all hung up on their methods. And, and, I mean, they were just like that. And they had their service where they had the organ playing, the Hammond organ playing, and they sang the old hymnals. But he said, you know what's funny, Pastor Mark? He said, after that service is over, they have a second service now. And he said, I lead an entire praise team with drums and saxophone players and piano players, guitar, bass, and he yeah. said all of us come together and we get in there and he said they call it the contemporary service, but he said it's all praise and worship. Amen. It's all praise and worship. It's Amen. nothing out of the old, and I'm not knocking the hymnals at no. all, okay? I'm not knocking that because I, there's still a lot of them that move me. A lot of them move me. Uh, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Yeah. Sweet hour of prayer. I mean, I'll, some of those I'll never let go of. Those are really good songs. But what God's doing right now is different. Those songs were written for generations of people that were suffering, right. that were in depression and locked up uh, under lock and key, and they needed to see a miracle in their lives. And most of those songs were written during wars, wartime, the Great Depression, and things like that. And then they were written to give people hope. But we're in a new era now, a new time now, a dispensation where praise and worship is ushering the entire body of Christ into the presence of God. Right. Amen. When God gets through, everything that has breath is going to praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Everything that has breath is going to praise the Lord. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. As a believer, as a believer, when you tie yourself into this Davidic system of praise, and you start dwelling in an attitude of gratitude, and get rid of every root of bitterness, God can and will unlock the supernatural in your life. Amen. He can and He will unlock the supernatural in your life. Amen. you got to get that revelation of praise, begin dwelling in an attitude of gratitude, and then dig every root of bitterness out of your life. Amen. The Bible says a root of bitterness will spoil you, will defile you, it will choke you and shut down your access to God. Amen. That's right. It'll do it. It'll do it. 
If you're a child of God, you can't hold on to every injustice. Right. Everything. I mean, life is not fair. We know that. All right? Life is not fair, but you can't hold on to every injustice in your heart. If you're a child of God, the promise to you is that all things work together for them who love the Lord Amen. and are the called according to yes. His purpose. Amen. That means a shift is going to take place. Right. There will be a momentum shift in every one of our lives. And the very, the very thing meant to destroy you, amen, that the very person who's been attacking you, the very situation that threatened you, when the shift takes place, God will use it to bless you. Amen? amen. He will use it to bless you. But if you're still angry over what happened, if you're still bitter about what they said, you won't be ready for the shift. Amen? Right. This is important. Yeah. you got to get this part right here. Don't do any good to get excited about praise if you're not ready to let go of bitterness. Right. Let go of the injustices. Release them. Turn them loose. Breathe them. Exhale. Get them out of your system. Get them out of your life. Breathe them out. Amen. That's how you process. If your attitude is wrong, then, then midnight represents just another day that has went by where God didn't move for me. Another day has went by and God still hasn't done what I asked Him to do. If your attitude is wrong, that's how you think. And you know that I'm telling you the truth. Whatever the thing is you're asking God for, if your attitude is wrong, every time a new day dawns, you say, well, it's another day I didn't get what I wanted. It's another day God didn't answer my prayer. It's another day that he fell short. Then we start asking ourselves, I wonder if he even moves anymore. I wonder if he even heals anymore. You see how the trickle-down effect takes place? That's how you process thoughts when a root of bitterness has crept into your life. But if you guard your heart and you keep your attitude right, then midnight represents a transition. It represents a new door, a new dimension, a new day. Another new exciting day where God's about to manifest new purposes in your life. Amen. It might still be dark for a few more hours, but rest assured, once midnight has passed, the sun inevitably will come up soon. Amen. 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 It will come up soon. Hallelujah. This is the key of David. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Hallelujah.